Okay, so today we got a little bit of a challenge. Um, I saw this scene and I really fell in love with those blues and those distant mountains and the uh, aerial perspective that's very strongly shown here. But um, the challenge is that it's not, um, it's not a gimme scene. There's a number of things in here I think I'm going to have to change in order to make this composition work. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to tackle today. Changing the scene, changing the elements in a scene to make it, um, to make it a little more uh, compositionally friendly. By the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of along a somewhat busy road here. I tried uh, driving further down to see if I could find the uh, vantage point that was a little more conducive to uh, a nice plein air painting spot, and I just could not find it, so. So here we are, traffic and all. Just using a dark blue, ultramarine blue, and some transparent red oxide, I'm sorry, not transparent red oxide, but uh, a lizard and permanent to uh, block in the overall um, scene here. It's late afternoon, so some pretty dramatic light. This scene is totally backlit. By the way, if you're uh, new to my channel or if you haven't done so yet, if you could um, hit the subscribe button, that'd be awesome. Um, helps me to keep making these videos, encourages me, and it makes uh, YouTube happy. So they keep uh, showing my videos to people. and. There is also a uh, residence behind me, so you're going to hear people talking in and out. I have no idea who these people are. I've never stopped here before. They have no idea who I am. So I'm changing up this scene just a little bit. It does go downhill, but I'm putting more of an arc. Um, to this foreground to give it some interest. The nice thing about plein air painting is, you know, when you're out here, you can borrow elements from just slightly different angles to uh, give you the scene that you want. And, you know, just change things up a bit. There are some uh, clouds in the sky a little further back. It's a perfectly sunny day. Pretty much all day. There are some thin wispy clouds. Hopefully they don't um, wreck the show here. But um, yeah, 
think the primary thing I want to do is just work out these shadows, these uh, foreground darks. I still want to keep them fairly cool. Using a lot of viridian here to uh, tone down the more magenta tone that I just put in earlier. Now, as these trees go downhill, there is a lot of um, highlights on them. I'm going to basically ignore most of those highlights. I really want to keep this uh, strong dark value mass here. So um, I'll have some highlights in there, but they're not going to be nearly as intense as what I'm actually seeing out here. It's wonderful when you can get out on a uh, day like this and paint. Summer days like this are a bit of a rarity in this area. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania right now and um, it's usually uh, pretty humid. in the summer and with all that humidity comes uh, more of a um, muted light. So um, this nice uh, crystal clear sunlight or almost crystal clear is uh, very refreshing. So next, um, now that I have my Darks uh, in here. I'm going to put in a little bit of the foreground green. I want to get that temperature established. So that I know how cool I can go with those uh, background mountains. Some artists like to paint the background first, work their way from back to front. I'm typically opposite, work from front to back, just because for me, um, it's easier to key in the foreground colors and then the key the sky, which is your most distant element, off of those foreground colors. A lot of times if you start with the sky, you run the risk of going too dark, period. Or running out of dark as you move to the foreground. Because generally as things get closer to you, the values, the shadow value, values are going to get darker. And a little bit warmer. 
And so if you uh, start with the sky that's too dark, you know, you're gonna have to make the mountains, the distant mountains a little darker, then the middle ground area a little darker, and this a little darker, and then you might be like almost pure black here in the foreground. Which at least I don't want. So there's kind of a method to my madness here of going the opposite way of of other artists. And if the other way works good for you, then hey, stick with it. Um, some artists might have no problem keying in a very light sky. And if you don't have any issue with that, then go for it. There's no um, completely right way. The right way is really what works for you. And it's good to watch, um, you know, numerous artists work because no one artist has a claim on the best way to do it. And if they claim they do, they're lying to you. Or they just uh, don't know any better themselves or they don't watch you, watch you watching any other uh, videos. Okay, as we move up into the trees, there are highlights in the trees. I'm going to go uh, darker with those. And the reason I'm going dark with those is because I want them to feel like they're part of the tree, not part of the ground. But I can see already that I'm going to have to simplify these and not go quite so literal with them because it's going to break up too much the... Uh, the strong value masses I have here in the front. I'm going to keep working my way back.
and I'm really just uh, simplifying the color masses right now. So I'm squinting at this scene quite a bit so that I can simplify this mass and compare this overall color mass with this mass here to make sure that this one here feels further back than this. That's going darker, uh, less yellow, so you're going cooler. And when I look at the landscape, I squint at it. It's so important to do that so that you uh, keep looking at the whole thing and not just your, um, not just one spot. By the way, I don't think I told you the colors that I'm using, so let me um, do that really quick while I'm remembering. Titanium white, cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow light, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, transparent red oxide, cadmium red, um, uh, permanent magenta, or um, uh, I'm sorry, not permanent magenta, alizarin permanence, or uh, alizarin crimson. Um, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, cerulean blue, cerulean blue, viridian and chromium green oxide. So once again, squinting at my scene as I put these in and assess them. If I don't squint, if I look just at these trees back here, I'm going to end up painting them too dark and too neutral. But when I squint at the whole scene, I can see that this compared to this is a lot cooler. So I have to uh, you know, lighten the value, cool the color a little bit. always about those uh, relationships it's not trying to get this exact color it's getting the how cool or warm and how light and how dark this color is compared to this color compared to that color compared to that color so on and so forth if you get those relationships correct then your painting is going to look good Don't get them correct, uh, forget it. And for me, judging these value relationships is easier than judging these, which is, or even these, which is why I like to work, uh, work front to back most of the time. There are times where I work, work reverse. Clean out the palette. Okay, so I noticed a bit of a glare on my canvas. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on that. I'm a one-man show here. So, um, can't always see what the camera or the sun are doing. Uh, since this scene is pretty much backlit and the sun keeps getting lower in the sky, it's a bit of a challenge to try to keep it all all situated, but uh, I will do my best, so.
so just going for an overall tone here for this distant mountain this distant mountain is the whole reason why I picked this scene in the first place I love those blues I'm a total sucker for blues in these mountains whether I'm out west or in the east when I see these blues I just get really drawn in Okay, this is a point where I want to really carefully compare the values between this and this and that. I could go a little bit darker. And notice how I'm drawing my colors only from the very cool side of my palette. Somebody stopped to see what I was doing. Gave me a thumbs up, so I guess I'm doing all right. As I said before, if you think I'm doing all right, uh, please give me a thumbs up there. That guy's thumbs up won't make a hill of beans difference on YouTube, but your thumbs up will. So, and it'll make, make it all worth it, the fact that I'm standing out here and it looks like I'm talking to myself with these neighbors looking at me. Probably thinking dude's by himself talking to himself. We better call somebody. Now in this hill there are some uh, very subtle highlights, but I'm not going to uh, do anything about that yet. I really just want to judge, squint at it and judge the overall values. And it does seem like I can go with the foreground greens maybe a little bit lighter. Just to really try to get that relationship correct. Um, this is the important part. This is the most important part. This is called uh, key and then. <clears throat> it's basically, you know, capturing the difference, in, like I said before, difference in light and darkness between the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. And if any of them are out of whack, you want to get those adjusted before you do any kind of a uh, 
detail work whatsoever. You want a solid foundation to build off of. No amount of detail is going to fix bad values, bad value and color relationships. If you've watched my other videos, you've heard me say that um, details do not give you realism. Some people mistaken, especially beginners and non-artists think it does, but it doesn't. How you doing? So I can see I need to lighten uh, this uh, area here. Just did a little trick that Scott Christensen taught me when I took his class is to uh, tilt your head upside down and look at the scene. It looks weird to people who are watching you, but it really um, helps open you up to see uh, the colors and the values. Okay, I think I'm going to block in the sky. The sky is really bright. The sun is um, dipping down over there. And um, sky is very uh, intensely bright. It's almost colorless. So I'm just using titanium white a little bit of lemon and a little bit of cerulean. Because when you're getting on these late afternoon backlit scenes, the sky is not really blue, at least not this low on the horizon. If you stick blue in there, like ultramarine blue or something like that, you're just gonna kill it. It's just not what it is. As you get slightly higher, you can put in a little bit of maybe a cerulean. But overall, you want that nice light value. You're going to use a lot of white, but it's worth it. Okay, so honestly, at this point, you could pack up and go home, and you would have uh, enough information to do a pretty decent painting in your studio. But, of course, we want to go a little bit further than this. So let's do that. The reason why I say you could pack up and go home is because you got the overall relationships. 
And that should be your number one priority when you're out plein air painting, getting the relationships. I uh, wanted to say too, if you want to uh, go a little further in supporting my channel, I have a uh, Patreon account set up. And if you uh, contribute, it helps with things like all the paint materials I have to buy, because all this requires you know extra paint, canvas, that I normally wouldn't be using. Um, and all the other expenses, gas to drive here. This place took a little while to get to, and just driving around finding something interesting to paint is can be challenging enough as it is. Um, but anyway, if you want to support my channel, um, you can support me on Patreon. And if you do, um, what I'm going to be doing for my supporters is once a month giving away one of my oil sketches here to uh, one of my Patreon supporters. So you could win this sketch if you like it. Um, And depending on the level, you, you can have multiple uh, chances to win each month. But it, it um, helps me. One of the things I'd like to get um, when I get some support is a, a nice wireless microphone system. This microphone has a tendency to click a bit and make some noise when I move around. It's a wired mic system, so I have this like gigantic cord going from me to the camera behind me. But a uh, wireless system costs costs some money, so uh, that's one thing I can I'm gonna do once I get some support. Maybe by the time you've seen this, I already have that, but if you could support anyway, that'd be awesome. Plus, you uh, might win a painting. Uh, there's a link below in the description. And uh, right now, at least in this viewing, uh, the support starts at um, $3, $5 if you want to get in on the drawing. $3 is uh, you get early access to the video. Now, if you're watching this five years from now, that maybe has changed, I don't know. But, um... They, anyway, it'd be awesome if you could uh, do that. But if not, I thank you for watching either way. Okay, so back in here, get some of this off to the side. There is these uh, ever so slight highlights in this blue area. Let's see if I can kind of replicate those. Step back, make sure that the it looks good. It seems like it looks good. <laughs> Maybe if I get enough Patreon supporters, I'll hire a camera caddy guy to come out and 
We'll really keep an eye on things. I'm just a solo show right now. Now it'd be tempting when you look at this uh, scene back here and you see these highlights, it's tempting to think that there's a whole bunch of yellow in there and there's not. Um, there is a suggestion of yellow but yellow is the first color to drop out as things recede. So you don't want to put a bunch of yellow in. I see you got a little bug there. Oh, that was way too much alizarin. The alizarin I have is super, super strong and I should not have grabbed that. Um, See how I grabbed that cadmium yellow light? That was the wrong color to grab. If I do add yellow into this, I want to use a cool yellow like lemon, not a warm yellow that's more toward orange. Um, let's see if we can save this bug here. So let's try that again. See that I'm running out of uh, titanium white. I'm going to test that a bit. It's too light. Let's go with more cobalt, a touch of lemon, and maybe just a touch of alizarin. see how that looks that's pretty good now you see on my palette it looks still um, pretty blue at least it does to me but when you put it up here compared with all that intense blue it does have you know a yellowish suggestion that's where it's always always about relationships no color means a hill of beans on its own. It's very important what you put next to it. I'm going to go a little thicker now with the uh, darker part of the mountain.
Okay, so I did a little adjustment with the camera. Had to get some more titanium white here. It's really tricky with the sun getting as low as it is. I'm trying to keep a glare off the uh, painting. It's also a glare for me too. It's really important when you are working, especially in lighting like this, that you um, wear dark colors. You do not want to come out here wearing um, like a light shirt or um, a brightly colored shirt. Wear something dull and dark. Otherwise, um, the sunlight will bounce right off your shirt back onto the uh, onto your painting. It'll just cause this obnoxious glare that you won't be able to get rid of. I made that mistake more times than I like to admit. Okay, now I want to get the uh, highlights in these middle ground trees right here. And they're going to be uh, warmer and a little darker than these back here, but you definitely don't want to get as green as you would in the foreground. I'll test that out, that's way too warm. I'm using a uh, imitation badger hair brush that's kind of falling apart, I'm, I see. That is better. And uh, by the way, if you're interested, I teach uh, live online painting classes. Do it through uh, Zoom. We meet most every Saturday of the month. There's five Saturdays, we'll meet four, but we spend uh, four weeks doing a painting from start to finish. And I take you through it pretty much stroke by stroke and I explain everything to you. We don't paint nearly as fast as we are out here. Just because we don't have to. But, um, take you through, show you how to do the painting. At the end of four weeks, you'll have your painting. I also demonstrate it on my own and record it. So you can see how I paint on my own outside of a teaching environment. And give you uh, some 
personal feedback, either uh, live during the class or uh, you can email me your painting and really help you understand the process and take your work to the next level if you are uh, if feel if you feel like your work has hit a plateau um, or if you're somewhat new to painting and you're just not sure where to go with it um, you like this this is uh, definitely for you all the sessions are recorded so if you miss a session no sweat It'll be recorded, you can watch it later at your convenience. Or if you just want to watch it again, a lot, of, a lot of my students like doing that. That doesn't happen with the live in-person workshop. And by the way, these are cheaper than live in-person workshops. Um, but uh, you get to watch. Watch it as many times as you want to while you're a member. And, Plus, uh, when you become a member, you get immediate access to all the past recordings and demonstrations. And we do a uh, Q&A session, live Q&A session, live critique session. Those are also recorded in case you can't make it. You can even submit your painting and have it critiqued without being there. Uh, anyway, check it out. If you're interested, um, click on the link below in the description. And you'll go on to the waiting list. Um, we have to have a waiting list. Because we only let people in once a month. Because you don't want to come in in the middle of the month when we're halfway through a painting. And seating is limited, so when the door is open, it is first come, first serve. Sounds like they need the garden hose back there. But check it out if you're interested. If you go on the waiting list, that doesn't mean you're committed or anything like that, but... Um, I do recommend though that you don't go on the waiting list unless you're serious about it. Uh, if you're serious about your work, I'd uh, love to have you there. This is the part of the process that I really like when I know I have my values pretty much under control and it's just going in and you know, making adjustments and things like that, adding texture. just such a beautiful afternoon too. So you probably notice I'm working um, kind of reverse from when I started this. At first I started from front to back. Now I'm kind of flipping it around and going from back to front. And I can do that because I have the value masses overall established and the color temperature is established. So now you know I can work on the back make adjustments as needed and then creep up to the front again. My main goal is uh, make sure that this looks further away than this and this looks further away than that. No matter what else I do, I have to make sure that that happens in this painting. If I destroy that, then I destroy this painting, essentially. I 
I did a lot of these uh, trees here with horizontal strokes. Horizontal strokes, though, can appear lighter in value because the little ridges that your brush makes will pick up um, light. And I uh, want these to look a little darker, so instead of going in with darker paint, I can just knock down these uh, horizontal strokes to a certain degree. So I'm going to soften this edge a little bit. Soften this one even more. Check my glare here. I think it's looking pretty good. I'll find out when I get this home and I edit it later. There have been times where I've gotten the paint, uh, recording back home and I've had to completely delete it because there was some issue, some kind of glare, some, some technical difficulty and that is really frustrating. The only thing that isn't frustrating is I might have got a good painting, but you guys didn't get to see me do it because of some problems. So hopefully, I hope and pray that's not the case this time. It's always tricky with these uh, glaring light scenes. Okay, so these trees down here, they have some highlights on them, but I don't want to get too crazy with them because it will destroy the, um, the more stuff I put in down there, the more it'll destroy the, um, that nice strong value pattern I have there. Let's see what I can do here without totally wrecking it. Part of the allure of these backlit scenes is that they they can create such strong value patterns that really make for a nice painting. But there's a fine line between keeping those strong value patterns and putting in some interest so that it doesn't look just totally flat. And it's usually recommended that you don't do a completely backlit scene, that you do more you know, three-quarter view where there is light on three-quarter of the scene, three-quarters of the scene. But I'm kind of a rebel in this regard, plus I'm just drawn to these things. I just love these backlit scenes. And that's ultimately what matters. If you really like it, then go for it. Don't let somebody else's rules um, stop you.
Ah, uh, you know, I just figured out part of my glare problem. There is a uh, traffic sign right behind me and the whole back, the aluminum back is completely glaring against this canvas. So uh, I'm gonna sh shut off and turn everything just a little bit and hopefully that'll solve our problem. Okay, so hopefully that looks better. I still have a little bit of that glare on my um, palette here, but uh, if I turn the cam, if I turn the whole thing the other way, then the uh, camera is going to be pointing directly into the sunlight, and that's not going to be good either because that's probably going to create kind of a haze on the lens, and then you're not going to see anything. So, um, but actually, that creates an interesting. It kind of illuminates my palette a little bit, which is interesting, um, and the painting somewhat, but also creates this annoying shadow. So I apologize for that, but this is the reality of plein air painting. You are constantly dealing with um, situations that are not very, that are not always friendly. And I've dealt with plenty over the years. I remember one time painting in Rocky Mountain National Park and I uh, had a big time glare from the rocks behind me. The sun was bouncing off the rocks and um, casting this super obnoxious glare on my uh, canvas. Not too dissimilar from what we have going on here from the road sign. I could maybe tear down the road sign, but I'm sure that the cops would get called on me and I don't want to go to uh, jail, so. So we just have to contend with it. All right, so back to where I was before, before I noticed our glaring problem. <laughs> no pun intended, that was a bad pun. I'm full of bad puns sometimes. It's so nice so when you're out here and when there isn't any traffic going by you just hear the birds and the sounds of nature and it's one of the wonderful things about uh, plein air painting I never really hunted but um, I grew up in rural Minnesota and I grew up around a lot of uh, hunters and they would uh, talk about you know how even if they didn't see anything for hunting they still just enjoy being out there I'm sure somebody in the comments section will have a problem with hunting but if that's the case, please don't comment on that because I'm now not trying to turn this into a political discussion on the virtues or the vices of hunting. I just, uh, just using the analogy there of uh, how just being outside can be a wonderful thing. Even if your uh, purpose for being outside isn't completely fulfilled, 
There's nothing like being in nature. Yeah, I actually see some, it's interesting, some almost lavender. I guess it's the ground showing through. Lavender spots that are almost the same, pretty much the same value as the green grass. I should get some of that in there as I'm doing right now because that, that'll be a nice relief and offset to the, uh, to the fairly intense green that's up front here. see some ochres in here. So it's so wonderful about planar painting is uh, you're gonna get so much that the camera will not give you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Nice. You too. Okay, so now, now to the foreground trees. So we started with these and we're coming back around full circle. In a certain way, I'm kind of liking that glare off that sign. I don't know if you guys are, but it's allowing me to see, you know, the color in these shadows a little more clearly. I need to make sure that I don't go too, uh, too light and colorful with them. I'll be uh, heading out west soon, but by the time you guys see this video, I'll have been back from out west. Uh, I gotta practice um, my high altitude breathing technique. If you watch some of my videos from last fall when I went out to Wyoming, I sound like Darth Vader with the tracheotomy. Um, just the altitude was not getting along with me. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I do better this time. Which is another good reason to subscribe because uh, those videos will be coming out after a while and you can watch those too. And I keep forgetting to say this to people, I think you gotta hit this notification button or something like that to uh, also that notifies you when I post a new video. I'm not an expert on this stuff, but that's what they say.
Okay, I kind of feel like I'm losing some of the strength of the darks that I had in here before. So I'm going to go back in and just punch those up a little bit. I really want strong uh, value patterns in here. Okay, before we go too much further, I want to uh, play around with these cast shadows a bit. This cast shadow here that I'm painting is really extended further back from when I started. I'm going to chase it just a little bit, just because I think it's going to uh, help the composition. My goal is not to freeze, um, you know, one second in time when you're out here. You can't, and that shouldn't be your goal either. Um, I mean, you only have so much time before things change too much, but um, generally anything that happens within those couple hours outside of a full all-out light change like if you know goes from sunny to overcast but generally anything within that time frame is kind of open game at least I consider it open game
I think they said they're going for ice cream. That actually sounds pretty good. There is an old-fashioned ice cream stand not far from here, but I gotta stay away from that. It is kind of interesting listening to uh, other people's conversations when you're out here doing this. Not that I'm trying to listen, but you just can't help but hear it. I'm just kind of happy that they did, didn't decide to come up and talk to me for 45 minutes. I don't mind. I've, uh, I like having company. I like chatting for a little bit, but sometimes they go a little overboard. And when you're trying to get a painting done, uh, you only have so much time. It's like one time many years ago, I was painting a blue heron through a spotting scope and you never know when they're gonna fly away and this guy came up to me and proceeded to give me a complete full total bio of the guy who lived down the road that he knew who painted trains I heard about all the different trains he painted when he painted them what shows he does the whole works I was just like yeah uh-huh that's that's great I just kind of had to ignore him and just continue painting so that my bird did not fly away before I was done. So I'm painting the highlights on these trees and once again I got to be careful that I don't go overboard with this. Basically just enough to show the form. It's pretty much all you need.
when you're dealing with something this complex to remember you don't need to explain everything the, the viewer doesn't need to know exactly what's happening with these trees and the exact structure of them i mean you can try but you probably just drive yourself crazy doing it At the end of the day, you just want them to know that these are trees. If they get that, that's good. Now, I know that this... Um, sign glare problem that we're having here is um, going to cause quite a bit of a continued glare as we go. I think I might try to whip the camera around again. It's just getting to the point where these darks, I can barely tell them because of the uh, glare. So let's turn the camera around again. Okay, so got the camera flipped around. And unfortunately, we're still, we stood dealing with some glare on the palette. There's nothing I can do about it. If I turn it too far, then we have the sun glaring on it. The other way, I have that stupid sign. In a perfect world, I'd have a big blanket or something like that to just stick over the backside of that sign. Not the front, but the backside. And, um, problem would be solved but I don't have that capability I don't have a big blanket with me if I did I'd really think about doing it but it's my luck a cop would show up and figure out some way I violated something and then I'd end up getting a ticket or worse And the other bummer is that it kind of changed my whole view, so I can't see some of the detail in these trees that I could see before. The uh, people who live in the house right by here are getting quite anxious. Apparently the kids are being told they gotta clean up something really good if they want ice cream. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one thing I want to get in that is on this tree here is there's a really neat sky hole. Actually, it's, I guess you'd call it a mountain hole now since it's a mountain behind there, not the sky. But um, I want to get that shape in because it does a nice job of implying the, uh, the branch to that uh, This apple tree is constructed from.
where the sun is bright. This, that sign is bright. This was literally though the only vantage point I could get for this uh, scene that was decent. Um, everything else, the trees covered up the background hills too much, or um, or you couldn't even see them at all. So, just my luck though. They have this big uh, sign here to totally throw things off. But that's uh, par for the course, as I said earlier. Another thing you can do with a situation like this is um, you could stick up an umbrella and point it back behind you. I've done stuff like that before, but I did not bring my umbrella because I did not anticipate needing it, but I should have brought it. It's kind of foolish of me not to. It was a little breezier, and I don't always like setting up, setting up umbrellas when it's breezy because it's like you're just asking for your uh, whole, you know, for your setup to go for a undesirable ride. want to uh, darken these highlights a bit. I think they got a little too carried away on value. I uh, constantly preach with my students and that about angles of consequent values and how overall the uh, highlights in your uprights, which are your trees and that, should not be as light as your ground plane. But kind of was not following my own rule. It's not really my rule. It's John F. Carlson came up with it, but I was not practicing when I preached. Subduing so these is uh, definitely helping. Uh, pretty much on the home run stretch here. Um, stick around to the end because then you'll see the final painting. There's so much glare on this right now that it's, I don't know how it looks. I'll see when I edit this video later. But um, I know even when I get home, I'm probably going to be surprised at how it looks. Hopefully it's a good surprise. Not a bad one. It is, uh, it's kind of fun when you get back to your studio from plein air painting and you pull out your you know what you did and you look at it it's uh it can be good it can be bad um one thing right here is i had two even a situation i had a highlight coming down there another highlight coming down there that was way too even from a compositional perspective so got rid of that
And um, as I said, if you're new to my channel or if you haven't done so yet, uh, you could please subscribe. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. And um, yeah, consider uh, becoming a Patreon supporter. The link is below. And if you want to study under me, I'd love to have you there. Uh, the link is also below for that. Okay, I think it's time to go get some supper. So thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you again soon.